when I say did Twitter kill the boys in the bus, when I wrote that, I was doing a, uh, a Shorenstein Fellowship at Harvard, which focuses on press and uh, politics. This was after the 2012 campaign. I had covered that. And during the course of that campaign, it became apparent, talking to my friends who are Republicans and Democrats and reporters, that Twitter was just this obsession, that as much as the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign tried to shape narratives in traditional ways, the front page of the Times and the Post, the getting in the front block of the Today Show, that stuff that mattered in 2008. By 2012, the assignment desk for all of politics was just Twitter. And, and it has been ever since. It has been ever since. And um, I don't want to say that it ruined journalism because, again, there are good aspects to Twitter. Um, but it did really narrow the focus um, on just process things, on optics. The Romney campaign was apoplectic every day because their campaign embeds were tweeting about things like Romney's jeans or, um, you know, they did a, uh, I remember they did an event at Ford Field in Detroit, I forget about what, and like it was there like in the field, but like the stadium was empty and so all the embeds were just tweeting pictures of the empty stadium. It wasn't even supposed to be a rally. It was just like an event in Ford Field. And so things like that made the Romney campaign furious. And I remember talking to Matt Rhodes, uh, who was the campaign manager for Romney when I was writing this paper. And he cited a famous quote from Roger Ailes, infamous you yeah. know, <laughs> Roger Ailes, who- Fox you know, News. Fox News used to work in politics. Um, and. Ailes had this theory about politics called the orchestra pit theory of politics, which is that on, on a stage you have two political candidates and one of them proposes a solution to Middle East peace and the other one falls in the orchestra pit. What do you think the media is going to cover? Obviously the guy falling into the orchestra pit. And like that's basically what Twitter is. It, is, um, it fetishizes what's happening right now. It is obsessed with scandal and outrage. Um, and reporters, individual reporters, you know, are incentivized, whether they are doing it intentionally or not, to get those retweets. And, you know, yeah. you will get those retweets when you write stories that are primed for, you know, sharing and outrage and not the deeply reported piece about the climate legislation that's moving through a Senate committee. And it, it creates a sort of a collective wisdom of its own and, uh, and sort of a hive mind. Like m my experience on the other side of that in 2012 is I can remember being at that first presidential debate between Obama and Romney. And it was the first, you know, I, we had done the debates in 2008, so I had experience with presidential debates. But in 2012, like Barack Obama, 10 minutes into the debate, isn't doing that well. We know that from backstage, we can see that. Usually you wouldn't be able to tell if the rest of the country thinks that yet or how if journalists think that or if anyone else thinks that because people would, you'd hope, watch and make up their own mind. But on Twitter, people started freaking out and journalists started freaking out about it, like, oh, Barack Obama's not doing good. And the conventional wisdom hardened in about 10 minutes into the debate that it was, that he'd done something, that he was having a horrible debate. I think Ben Smith put up a story on BuzzFeed before the debate was even over that said Barack Obama bombed this debate. And it was our first experience with, OK, the entire collective wisdom or the conventional wisdom from the Washington press corps was just hardened within 10 minutes of a presidential debate. And there's nothing we can do to shape that now. Correct. And it kind of killed off the notion of a spin room after the debate, because like yeah. when the when the CW is hardened in 10 minutes, there's kind of no point <laughs> for Axelrod or Pluff to come in the spin room and spin reporters when they've already been spun up by what their colleagues have been saying on Twitter. So Twitter and social media and the internet in general incentivize for journalists speed, brevity, uh, takes over reporting, prediction. Like, what does that do to, you know, you're a journalist who's just trying to uh, report the news. What does that do to that practice of journalism? <laughs> it makes it sloppier. It it perverts the ideal of what journalism was supposed to be, at least as I was taught it, and my parents who were journalists were taught it. Um, and what and what was that? Uh, or what is that? <laughs> hard work, research, patience, frustration, um, playing the long game uh, in terms of 
this story might take a while and I've got to dig into it. Um, journalism, in part because of uh, revenue uh, issues, uh, can't fund a lot of journalists traveling anymore. Um, and so when I was getting into it, I was traveling around the country a lot and I was very lucky for that. And unfortunately, today, a lot of journalists don't have the ability to get on the road and expensive flight in a hotel and travel and meet people and spend time. And often, like some of the great writing out there, people are paying for it out of their own pockets. And that means a lot of reporters are just writing from their desk, which means you're looking at Twitter, you're texting people on iMessage, you are making phone calls, but maybe even not. Um, and anyway, the you'll see a line in a lot of news stories that are about controversy or gaffe. And I think the listeners will recognize it. It'll say, so-and-so did not immediately respond to a request for comment. So, you know, back when I was in journalism school, not that journalism school is the best, but, you know, sometimes they taught you you couldn't publish something until you had a response. Mm. Or you had to wait Novel. at least, at least you had to wait a day. <laughs> Maybe six hours. Yeah. You know, now the incentive, as you mentioned, is publish this fast so we have it first and we get the clicks. Um, that doesn't mean that's not, you know, sometimes those articles aren't rigorous, but very often they're not. And so I don't, again, I don't want to be like priestly about how journalism used to be compared to where it is now. Like media always changes. And as a consequence, the formats change. Um, but, uh, you know, I... You know, I, I'm grateful, and even, this is true even at CNN. I've had editors and bosses who have pushed me to be like, "Hey, like, you need one more source on this. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's let's let standards and practices take a look at this. We need a lawyer to look over it." And I, as a reporter, would be pulling my hair out, being like, "We gotta publish. We gotta publish." And now that I'm older, with a little more hindsight, I'm just glad that you know I had editors like that because I don't think a lot of younger journalists are coming into the business right now um, with those sort of values that I and my the people that taught me how to do this stuff cared about. But, you know, the same incentives that, um, you know, motivate a fitness model on Instagram and a TikTok influencer often motivate journalists now, right? You want to make a name for yourself, get attention and like live in the bloodstream of the internet.